such an interesting question that I'm going to tell you the answer right at the very start because I, I think that it's important to set up my thinking and framework before we jump into it. I think they can, just not yet. The question is, why can't hip hop artists fill stadiums? There's been chatter about this for many, many years. And if you don't know what I do, the show is Derek G Speaks Volumes, where I have a thesis, I have a theory, I have an idea that I wish to explore. And on the podcast today, it is that very topic of the seemingly unusual phenomenon of hip hop rap acts not reaching those astronomical stadium tour levels of other artists. And what I'd like to do is I found the question really interesting. I find the reasons why really, uh, I, I, I found it interesting to explore that and wanted to kind of unpack that with you. And I would love your thoughts. I would love your explorations as well, because none of the, what I say is fact. It's my opinion, but I think that what I do and how I explore music and different cultures. I think that there, there, there are reasons that I can kind of pick out that seem somewhat obvious. So this is how we're going to break it down. Look, we're going to talk about the biggest stadium shows ever or currently. We're going to talk about, in comparison, the biggest hip hop shows. Then I'm going to illustrate what I think are the problems as to why hip hop shows aren't reaching those same levels of stadiums. Um, I'm going to talk about who I think could pull it off and then we're going to have a little appendix where I'm going to talk about my radio show on Patreon and, and other updates in my life if I have them and think about them in time. But first, one thing to address right out the gates, hope you're well by the way, thank you for listening, is the difference because some of you might be saying, well, they've done it, they've done it. But a stadium is not an arena. The O2 Arena. I've seen Drake at the O2 Arena. Massive. 10, 20,000 people. Full. Great. Drake can do that. Great. Was it a great show? No, it was a great show. It was really good. Taylor Swift. Ed Sheeran. Let's say in Australia that the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, one of the, a stadium of like 100 plus thousand people. Ed Sheeran sold it out twice in two days. <laughs> like what the hell? There's a significant difference between an arena, which uh, I would argue is anywhere between five and 20,000 and a stadium, which I would say is anywhere between 30 plus thousand, but really is, you know, 50 plus is really where I think that the stadiums are like, you're playing a real, a real, 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 real stadium. And that's an important delineation because a lot of hip hop acts can sell out arena tours around the world. No problem, including the likes of Kendrick Lamar. So let's talk about the biggest stadium shows. This is a mixture because I, I went to Wikipedia and I pulled out the top 10 biggest, most highest grossing stadium shows of all time. And what's interesting is it has, it has peppered in there current acts. So this is not like, oh, well, Derek, you can't compare it to the Rolling Stones because blah, blah, blah. There are people in here as I will go over. So I think it, the top 10 is actually really indicative. So at number one, at almost a billion dollars, Elton John's Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour, which has been going for five years, if you minus a year and a half of COVID from 2018 to 2023. Farewell Yellow... Yeah, I, I, is it his farewell tour or is it just called Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour because, you know, of the song? Elton John, big, you know, legacy act, lots of oldies, lots of money. I would want to go see it. I don't know why I didn't actually. I should have. Makes sense that he can sell that much, has banger after banger after banger and has generations of people that are fans. And he's been touring it forever, you know, for years. Ed Sheeran's plus no, Divide Tour from 2017 to 2019, 255 shows. What's interesting about Ed Sheeran is that his ticket prices are significantly less. So arguably, if he was to want to flex on Elton, if he charged as much as Elton, he would have blown Elton out of the water. But that's not his brand. But maybe people wouldn't have turned up if it wasn't $40 for an Ed Sheeran ticket or whatever and 150 instead. Uh, coming in at 776 million dollars that was not that long ago and he's on his current tour now of whatever his album's called now and then you've got u2 and number three 
uh, in t- 2009 to 2011, you have Harry Styles from 2021 to 2023 with his Love on Tour tour, uh, for, which is almost $600 million and 165 shows. I'm going to rattle off the rest. Guns N' Roses, Coldplay, The Rolling Stones, and then The Rolling Stones again, Coldplay again, and then Roger Waters' The Wall Alive. Crazy that the Roger Waters could pull that off. You would think in there, not that The Weeknd is is hip-hop, but you'd think The Weeknd could have been in there. You'd think that maybe Drake could be in there. Maybe Kendrick could be in there. Maybe Eminem could be in there. Maybe Jay-Z could be in there. They're not. They're not. And two, two that I'd like to add to this list that aren't on this list because they're currently, I don't know, the, the votes are being tabulated. Taylor Swift, I would say, and her uh, um, Eras tour, I would argue, is going to be the number one most successful tour of all time once she's all said and done with it and beat Elton. I don't know that for a fact, but I think it's going to happen because lots of the analysis says that it's going to be a billion dollar plus tour. So, you know, just footnote there. Beyonce is on her Renaissance, not Renaissance, Renaissance tour and would likely break into that top 10 as well. But again, both pop or R&B acts or house, depending on how you'd classify Beyonce's music, not hip hop, which is indicative. So let's go into the biggest hip hop shows by comparison. The number one selling hip hop tour of all time currently stands at $110 million dollars which is like pales in comparison to the almost billion dollars of almost Elton John, Tubi, Taylor Swift, Kendrick Lamar on the Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers tour, where he did 73 shows, highest grossing tour in hip hop history. 73 shows isn't that many though, if you think about it. It's kind of like one big show in every major city, two in the, you know, probably did two in New York and things like that. The following after that, Interestingly, as an interesting tidbit, the after Kendrick Lamar's biggest, highest growing, grossing hip hop show tour, you have combined shows are the next ones in the lines of the highest grossing tours. So we have Aubrey, as in Drake, Aubrey and the three Migos, Drake and Future in their What a Time to Be Alive tour. You have the Watch the Throne tour with Kanye West and Jay Z. And then you have Jay Z and Beyonce on the run tour that in itself is its own microcosm of analysis which is to say outside of kendrick lamar the biggest hip-hop shows of all time are collaborative shows where you're combining forces between with two massive acts jay-z is massive kanye west is massive them doing it together also says the kind of appetite popularity desire for hip-hop arena shows stadium shows I think all of these shows were arena shows as well, so they're not stadiums. That source was new, hotnewhiphop.com, by the way. So let's, now that we've kind of set the groundwork, it, it just goes to show how much of a disparity there is between the pop world and the hip-hop world and the rock world and the hip-hop world. So let's go over some problems. Problem zero, not even number one, because I, it's a short point and I want to acknowledge it, is stadiums are hard to sell out man <laughs> you gotta know you gotta know you got the fan base there you gotta know that you're going to be able to sell that out quickly because it's huge and i think that whilst drake has i don't know 300 million followers or something bonkers like that can he sell out a stadium of a hundred thousand people in like the melbourne cricket ground i would say no and uh you got to be confident of that and i think that um Not many artists are willing to try it because I think they already know that they'd rather sell out three arena shows than than half fill a stadium or something. That's just a small point zero because it's 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 true and it's hard and you've got to really be confident that you got the fans of Ed Sheeran's scale. Okay, the real problem number one, I think, is the age of the hip hop catalog. So. For example, Rolling Stones, Roger Waters, The Wall Tour, Elton John, who else? Guns N' Roses, U2, you know, Coldplay even, to an extent. 
maybe less of an extent, large old catalogs. That's hugely important because you have multi-generational fans that can tap in. You can bring your, you know, the 50, 60-year-old dad can bring his 18-year-old daughter along to Elton John and they can sing Tiny Dancer together. And having that shared collective experience is something that only artists with long historic catalogs are able to do. Hip hop is celebrating its 50 year anniversary. It's it's younger than rock and roll. It's younger than traditional pop music. So I think that hip hop is not yet uh, benefiting from the multi-generational enjoyment. And I think that the, the Pink Floyds of the world, the U2s of the world in hip hop are in, in existence now. In as much as I think that a tribe called Quest and I don't know, what's another Nas, very important early hip hop, I would say wasn't hip hop wasn't at its peak, its mainstream peak. So I think that those sort of musicians don't have the same multi, won't have the same multi-generational Elton John appeal of you know, Elton John, U2, Guns N' Roses were big in the 70s and 80s, right? The early hip hop wasn't prime where it captured the global audience. Whereas I think Drake, Kendrick, Kanye represent capturing multiple generations. And I think that in 10 to 20 years time, then it might benefit from a multi-generational appeal where families can go to a hip hop event dads that are in their 60s going hell yeah i loved humble by kendrick and then maybe the kids might like it as well because you know kendrick lamar for for a good example seems to have that timeless appeal that kids are going to keep picking up and might therefore be able to sell out those stadiums i think also age of catalog means that you have wealthier older individuals with more money elton john it's all seated seated audience for Elton John. So they have that money to burn and to buy all those like seated box seats. Uh, but then you have people like, to go against my argument, Taylor Swift, Harry Styles, Ed Sheeran, that buck the trend of like them being record breakers, but they are in a traditional radio pop space, which I'll talk about in a second. The, uh, the other argument against this age of catalog is that perhaps these artists might have benefited from doing a stadium tour when they were at their absolute peak because further down the list, some of the top selling uh, stadium tours of the 2000s or early, early 2010s was people like Lady Gaga and the Monsters Ball Tour. And that's when she was at her peak. Could Lady Gaga do a stadium tour to the Taylor Swift extent now? I would say no, but she could do it in 2012. And so maybe Drake could have done a stadium tours in 20. 17 and same with Kendrick Lamar and they might have because everyone was in love with them and everyone they had number ones after number ones which they're not having now that maybe hip-hop artists aren't capitalizing on their absolute peak to absolutely cash in and get their money off a stadium tour the second problem is the style of music hip-hop rap is pop music it is popular music but it isn't specifically mainstream pop. Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, the people dominating Harry Styles, yes or white, but they play very friendly, radio friendly, mum friendly, family friendly radio music that just permeates every car ad, every uh, chip shop radio every radio station, every background music everywhere. And so the, that ubiquity comes with a level of fandom that I can't believe how many fans Ed Sheeran has, but I also can believe it. And you don't have that same ubiquity from Drake or from Kendrick. And so you can't have that level of penetration to have that level of stadium tour where everyone's just like, you know, we all know if you're listening to this, you love music quite deeply, but we all know people that just like music and they're like, yeah, I like that. Ed Sheeran. I'd just go see him. He seems like fun. He seems like a nice guy. I like his music. That's the majority of people that are spending, you know, that a hundred thousand people are turning up to see a uh, 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 ginger with a guitar, you know? No, no, I said that like it's shade. It's not shade. This is what he looks like. 
I would say also the style of the music, in my personal opinion and appreciation of hip hop, is that it is inherently more intimate, big bass, super bass, <laughs> and a mosh pit, and a feeling of this electricity of like really going hard and going at it. Drake may be different, but Kendrick, everyone's jumping, or like Playboy Cardi, everyone, or, or, or Travis Scott, everyone wants to go crazy. And I feel like if I was in the bleachers watching Playboy Cardi, fiend, 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 you know, just like going, yeah, cool, that looks fun down there in the marsh. Like it's less sing alongable, it's more like a bodily experience. So I don't know if I could, I could jump on board with just being in the absolute bleachers of 100,000 people watching Playboy Cardi. I think that also, and this is a massive generalization, I think there's less theater to to hip hop in a sense that rappers are cool. They're cool. And they they present themselves that way. Harry Styles is more of a showman. He's more of an entertainer. He wants to like charm the crowd. He wants to talk to everyone. He wants to play games. He wants to, what does your sign say? Oh, everyone, this person wants to propose. Not that everyone's like that, but I think that rap acts are just like, we don't F with that sort of thing. We don't want to just like butter up the crowd and do crowd work in the same way. I, Tyler, the creator is probably the one that I've seen to do it best where he's, he likes to chat. He likes to give opinions. He likes to call people out and make jokes because he's almost a comedian. But I think that you need quite a theatrical nature to be a real stadium act, which maybe the trends will change, but it's uh futuring doing any of that also the music itself isn't band oriented um some a lot of people probably don't want their favorite songs transposed to being played by bands and often you know and say in playboy kiti sense it's wrapped over the backing track of the original beat so if you i think when you go to stadium often it's really great to have more than just you on stage and a screen and you have bands there you know, a live experience, live music, when live music, like I don't think that hip hop is synonymous with like live recordings where you have like Eric Clapton and the live recording of um, Tears in Heaven. People aren't clamoring for the live recording of Marvin's Room by Drake, for instance. And I think it would be cool to see, like in Anar's case, I'd love to see a live orchestration of, of Illmatic but whether people want to see that at a stadium level, I'm not sure. Also, I would say that hip hop and the earning modality, the word I just made up, is different because Taylor Swift is a CEO that has, has built up a massive audience and a massive empire of live and, and music recordings. Whereas I feel like the hip hop entrepreneurialism and success hasn't come in the form, like at the at the highest level, hasn't come from live shows it has come from being an entrepreneur and mogul jay-z dr dre p diddy diddy lil wayne all these people have stakes in businesses sports teams tech companies record labels tv shows the biggest hip-hop artists in the world seem to reinvest their money and invest in lucrative businesses that make them billionaires that isn't them performing on stage so perhaps it's a musical cultural thing as well as like hip-hop as an idea is a culture it's dance it is art it is music it is turntablism it is sampling it is rap and i feel like part of that is an entrepreneurialism that means that maybe the comparison between taylor swift selling out a stadium tour is dr dre selling beats maybe that's the same thing Number three problem is that hip hop is inherently about collaborations. It's about features. It's about the, the, the album is not the focal focal point as much as the singles, as much as the big hotline bling type things where does Drake go on tour for his um, Take Care album? Sure. But I think people care more about passion fruit as a single rather than could you play this album front to back type thing so i think that the feature-led part of it is a tricky one for artists because a lot of hip-hop sicko mode for example travis scott is drake and travis and 
it would be cool to see that live, but then it, it would be so expensive to have all your features from all your albums on stage for your tour, which isn't going to happen. So when you think about Astro World and Travis Scott, to have it at its fullest effect that I would love to experience, it would I would love to have The Weeknd doing his his parts and Sway Lee doing his parts and and James Blake and all the other features on there, Stevie Wonder coming out and playing harmonica, but it's not going to happen because all these people, you'd go poor making your tour full of all these people and suddenly it's not your tour as much, but it's also the music that they make, you know? So features is a blessing and a curse in, in many ways. But on a positive side, the collaborative nature of hip hop means that you have, like unlike many other artists, artists have festivals in hip hop. So you've got you've got Camp Flognor, you have OVO Fest, you had the Astro World Festival, where it's like maybe the artists of the, that caliber are recognizing that collaboration is a huge part of them. And so you are curating a list of people to collaborate with you on a show and do stadiums that way. I don't know if these were in stadiums, but Astro World looked pretty large. It wasn't a stadium, but more of like a traditional festival stage. So the inherent collaboration of hip hop kind of in many ways opposes from being a a straight up and down stadium show. Whereas like Harry Styles doesn't have any features on his records. And so it's just him and a band really. This next one, problem four is an interesting one. I think that hip hop isn't, I don't know what the demographics are, but I think a lot of hip hop is quite male oriented until recently. I think it, the tide is turning and with the likes of Ice Spice or Glorilla or Coyle Ray or Megan The Stallion. But I think that for a, a lot of the time, it's very male oriented and therefore isn't as family friendly as some other mainstream genres. I also think that hip hop hasn't been known to be particularly until recently, particularly open to the LGBTQIA plus community. So that excludes a lot of people that would spend a lot of money to go to these shows in the same way that like Lady Gaga, Charlie XCX, Dua Lipa, Kylie Minogue, are very open to that audience. I think that being a bit more taboo in the hip hop space does, and being heavily male skewed does impact the stadium filling nature of the genre, which I think is evolving and changing with the likes of Tyler, the creator. And I think that a lot more queer mainstream, Lil Nas X for instance, hip hop acts will start coming out and we'll start to welcome more and more people across the board into the same spaces, which I welcome. Now, to finish up, who could do it? I think that, as I said, the the generations are changing and evolving and getting older. And I think that as these artists get older and their, their legacy builds and their catalog is aging, I think that there will be a time where there is a massive, hopefully, hip hop stadium tour that breaks records. Now, I, in my gut, I feel like these artists probably should have done it at their peak, much like the Harry Styles or Ed Sheeran's in many ways and not like the Elton John's, but here's a list. Eminem, I think Eminem needs a moment in order like to go away. He needs to go away for 15 years and then do his stadium tour. And I think he'd probably smash it because everyone misses him so much. And that's where he'd make bank. It's like Eminem, go, go enjoy your family for 15 years and then make $2 billion touring. Go on, lose yourself 10 times in a row. I think if Kanye West wasn't crazy, I think that he would be a stand-up star, such a deep, huge catalog, and people would want to hear everything from All of the Lights to Heard Him Say to, what's the Panda song? It's not called Panda, is it? You know? So, but I think that he's got a lot of um, reputation to rebuild, but he would have been on his way. I think that Kendrick Lamar is not too far away. I feel like either he will do it by having another peak album and then going on a stadium tour, I don't know if he's past his prime or like Eminem, he goes away for a long time and everyone misses him. And it's like, you got to see Kendrick live. I think that in order for any of these artists to convert, I think that 
the theatrical stadium nature of a stadium show would need to be marketed in a way that like, this is how it's going to feel different. And this is how it's going to feel like a spectacle. I think Drake, when I saw him, had this huge floor screen that was animated almost like a uh, like a reverse fishbowl where it was like he was standing on top of it. And it was really beautiful. Taylor Swift has a version of that. But how do you, do you have dancers? Do you have set pieces that are just larger than life? How do you make it feel more like, uh, intimate with a large group of people is a challenge. I think Drake, uh, again, could have done it at his peak, but could do it if he, you know, took some space. Everyone needs to take some space, I think, in order to really achieve it or have a banger album. But I think a lot of these artists are like past their prime. I'd love to see a Tyler the Creator stadium tour. I don't think Jay-Z could pull it off at this stage. He's more of a mogul, but he's laughing in his, in his bills, his dollar bills of Benjamins of, of money so I think he's totally fine the stretch for me would be Outcast. I think of Outcast because they've been away for long enough and I've ba basically broken up but I feel like if they were to announce a stadium tour and come back and you have The Lover Below and you have Speaker Box and you have Aquemini and you have all their records I feel like there's enough generations there that everyone loves them to this day young, young and old maybe they could do stadiums in major cities and one of them maybe maybe so yeah what do you think do you think that it's possible do you think that it will happen do you think it's just not as relevant to this style of music that stadium tours are as impactful and as big of a thing in hip-hop i tend to think that it's going to happen but it, until hip-hop is as ensheerenized and played absolutely everywhere, it's gonna be hard, but I think that there are artists out there that are able to achieve it, but it's a timing thing, it's a strategy thing, it's an elevation to like putting on a stage show that makes sense to a 100,000 people and not 10,000 people, because I think a 10,000 person hip hop show is a fun one, 100,000, I don't even know what that looks like to really get me, get me excited, maybe there's lots of fireworks or something like that. That is the podcast for today. Let's do a little appendix and talk about the Patreon and how it's going. Um, it's been pretty, pretty great, to be honest. It, like immediately have patrons, immediately have support. Uh, if I can continue to grow it and it tick over to the point where I can fully quit my job, it's going to be amazing. But I think at, the, at this present moment, I think the thing I like about it most is that like I'm doing my radio show and it's resonating. People are liking it. And um, even artists are really honored to be played on it. And I, I've never, I've rarely had that because my radio shows have always been small, but now it seems like I have a bit more influence. Um, so that's like, oh shit, like I'm just playing music I love. And now artists are like, well, thank you so much for playing my thing. And it's like, oh yeah, no, no worries. Like I don't see myself as having the platform or like to do that. So it's nice to have that platform to be able to do that. So that is, you know, something I'm going to think more about in terms of, uh, making sure that if I play something by someone that I think is cool, that they, uh, they know about it potentially, but it's been a cool ride and, and. If you don't know anything about it, if you've hung around for this long, I launched a Patreon to to help make more content, really, you know, so I can go out in the world and do more things and buy more gear and, and elevate what I'm doing and, and evolve as a creator for me and for you as well. So patreon.com forward slash G underscore Derek is the place to go. But that's uh, that's the start of it. And I'm really enjoying making the content and I'm getting a lot better as it every week I do it that's the updates for this week got a different shirt on and i will see you on the next podcast i hope you enjoyed last week's podcast with nothing as well but this has been Derek g speaks volumes let me know your thoughts i'd be really interested to hear your take on all this am i being controversial am i being fairly pragmatic i'd love to know thank you for listening see you next week bye